Hey everyone and welcome to the Color Authority. This is Judith podcasting out of Milan, Italy. I'm so excited for again another episode of my podcast. I'm going to be podcasting for the next couple of weeks and months with the most inspiring people in the world of color. So if you want to know more about color and learn about this topic, make sure you tune in to the Color Authority. Follow us on LinkedIn, follow us on Instagram under the Color Authority and let's see what my next guest has to say. Monta Hayrafi, my next speaker, is a Canada-based, internationally celebrated color archaeologist, writer, and public speaker. As a color archaeologist, her role involves examining and observing the past tendencies to understand the present trends and interpret the future color forecast for business purposes. She has an extensive background in the codings industry, color forecasting, marketing strategy, and international businesses, as she established color forecast palettes and color trend book concept for many companies around the world. Montaha lectured about color and trends virtually and in person in countless trade shows, conferences, and universities, and conducted also color workshops around the world. Montaha is the author of Groping for Truth, My Uphill Struggle for Respect, published in 2018, The Role of Color in Design, 2019, and co-author of Color Design Theories and Applications, published in 2012 and then again in 2017. She's currently also serving as VP Color Forecasting at Color Marketing Group. Daha, how are you today? Oh, I'm great, Judith. How are you? I'm wonderful. It's extremely hot in Milan, but it's been a beautiful day so far. So all good. That's great. Judith, I wanted, first of all, to say congratulations on your new consultancy business and how successful your podcasts have been with all what you are bringing to us, you know, from fascinating color professionals around the world. I really love it. Thank you so much, Montaha. So Montaha, you're calling in from your home in Canada, right? Correct. Yes. Little Guelph. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I was looking through your bio. We've known each other for so many years, but obviously the audience possibly has some questions regarding your person and your career, but Just a general question. What is color for you? I think the correct question to ask would be something like, what or who is Montaha without color in the universe? (laughs) (laughs) To me, color is everything in my life. Without color, I think in general, life would be so dull and so boring. Color lifts me usually from the ground up. Every morning when I open my eyes, the first thing I see is color. And you know, Judith, that I speak many languages, but the language of color is totally different. And I find that is more a universal language that everybody can understand, but yet is so challenging to learn and to master because not everybody is in tune to color. Right, exactly. You have been working in the field for, of color for so many years And what I feel uh, also after all my years that I've been working in color, I still don't know everything. I keep on learning and I keep on learning about color. Do you have that same thing? I always say that we are never knowledgeable 100% in something. And that's the main reason why I don't call myself color expert. Because if I was a color expert, it will mean that I have all the knowledge of the universe about color and I don't have anything else to learn. So yes, I and you and pretty much all of us who work with color, we keep learning every day a new thing about color. So what would you call yourself then in this moment? If you're not a color expert, how do you, how would you explain yourself and what you do to other people? Maybe people who are not even working in the color field. I found out the color archaeologist is really what defines me. And I found this terminology after a lot of research that I did to understand how can I explain what I do. And obviously, color archaeologist is not a popular thing to understand. What does it mean? And by the way, I'm the first color archaeologist in the universe. Color archaeologist, why I think is better than color expert, because Just like an archaeologist, I'm always digging and learning. I'm digging the past. I'm looking at the present. I'm trying to figure out how is that going to affect the future. 
So it's all connected. There would be nothing that we see today in the color arena, for instance, if it wasn't for the past, because it is, if we look at time, time is a continuum. The continuum of time is not a straight line, is a zigzagging line. And so color works in the same way. It is a continuum but it doesn't really go into a straight line for us to understand. It goes into ups and downs. And sometimes we forecast something and then something happens in the universe or in the world. And that will affect what we thought and predicted would be. And that is going to change everything. We're really never 100% certain about what is going to happen in the world of color. So you're always exploring and exploring and you have indeed a very interesting background. You just brought up the fact that you indeed speak so many languages because your upbringing, if people just listen to you and also people know about your your history, they'll be just like, who is this woman? You're born from Syrian parents. You grew up mainly in Venezuela. Then you live years in Dubai the Netherlands, and now you live in Canada. Uh, Maybe I missed a country, very likely I missed a country, and I missed a part of your history. But can you talk a little bit about all these influences and inspirations? And maybe this is one of the reasons why you enjoy exploration so much. Yeah, that's one of my main topics to talk a little bit about uh, my background. And so because I was born and raised in Venezuela, which is a tropical country, obviously, as you know, and colors in Venezuela are so bright and are so shiny because there's so much sun and there is so much light. I think that I find it super important to me to have sun and sunlight in my life. Like in a gloomy day, I just feel everything around me looks different and feels different. And so I personally find that living in countries where the sun always shines has had a great influence over me, but also over the culture and the people choices that they they make when it comes to color. I was lucky and life allowed me to live in so many continents. And because I also did so much travel around the world that was mostly related to work, but I did a lot of travel to enjoy the world. I'm most usually fascinated by the people and by the cultures and how they usually layer the colors to express how they their life is. So it's like their lives is superimposing to, to mm-hmm. the extent that I think feel that sometimes when I'm forecasting color to specific countries that are not, for instance, North America, or to a specific culture, I feel that if if I want to introduce to them a new color that is not part of their traditional colors, I feel like I'm going to commit a crime because I'm (laughs) going to disturb their, their culture choices. But I also know that If I introduce a new color to them, that might make them feel happy and see a different part of the world in their backyard. So I'm very inspired by cultures, but I am also super inspired by colors in nature. You know, Judith, sometimes we have some trees in the backyard uh, from our neighboring houses. And sometimes when I go and sit outside in the sun and I just stare for a long while into the trees just to look into the various degrees of green of the leaves and how they harmonize all together. When I am traveling, I usually look at the color of the soil around the world because, you know, each country has a different color of the soil depending yeah, on the mineral. Yeah, and it speaks so mm. much about the country and the region. Yes, yes. For instance, when I lived in Dubai, I used to collect the sand from the various deserts because in the UAE and that in the Gulf area. Each desert has a different color and a different texture. So I have tons of little containers, glass containers that is filled with sand and with rocks from all over the place. I love that. Earlier, you mentioned that you enjoy living in countries that are warmer, such as Venezuela, Dubai, obviously, also definitely very warm. Then you went to the Netherlands and now you've been in Canada for a while. Do you see also the differences living in four different regions in the past 20, 30 years of your life? Do you feel that there's a lot of differences or do you feel that people still, you know, have also similarities? There are various differences when you live in a country that has four seasons versus a country that has two seasons or even one season. 
Mm-hmm. And so, for instance, in Dubai, we always had two seasons, the sunny season and the rainy season, or the flower season and the sandy season. That's what we call that. When I came back to Canada, because I used to live in Canada before, or, or initially I came to Canada in 91, and I lived in Montreal for seven years before I moved to Dubai. But when I came back to Canada 11 years ago, it's sort of for the first time I experienced the four seasons in a different way. And obviously each season has its own colors and its own smells and its own layers of textures. Obviously, nobody here likes the winter time because uh, it's so dull and it's so cold, but still it has its charm. Like the snow has different colors depending on if we have sun shining on it or if there is no sunshine or depending in the morning, it's different from the afternoon and so on. But I'm usually fascinated with the, the fall colors, obviously, when all the leaves turn and you have the yellows and the oranges and the reds and the dark browns. And it all comes together like a beautiful orchestra, all orchestrated by Mother Nature. I I just love that. But also those different seasons and different colors that we see, they have a huge effect on our mental health as well. In northern countries where we don't have much sun usually, we do fall into those times of the winter depression that we call. When everything is dull, you need the sun. You really need to see colors because you know, Judith, that without light, the perception of color is different. And and we don't see the brightness and colors don't shine anymore. Yeah, growing up in the Netherlands, I can tell you that, yes, winter depression is a true thing. Now that I live in Milan, Italy, my, let's say, winter depression is doing a lot better. So people who speak multiple languages tend to have a greater view and understanding of different cultures. So your upbringing obviously influenced who you are, how you live, how you feel, how you speak. How has that influenced your view on color today even? So how do you make use of that in your daily business? You are right. Speaking more than one language opens your horizons to better understand cultures, but also to be open-minded, to receive those signals from the outside, whether it's related to cultures or whether it's related to color or it's related to anything. Uh, And I have, just like you, I have an easiness to understand languages that I don't even speak. But when it comes back to color and the language of color, for instance, when I travel, if I am in an airport, I could tell sometimes uh, from what part of the world people are or where they live just by the colors they are wearing. Because you know that color and culture is so much related. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Probably you remember, Judith, if we go back to 2009, uh, remember the year following the economic crash. And so we started seeing purple and yellow appearing mostly in North America. But then I monitored this and I still monitoring this because we are seeing purple and yellow coming back 11 years later. But then it took about three years for purple to move from North America to Europe and then to Asia. It wasn't so easy, I mean, for distant countries to adopt the same color at the same time and at the same pace. So by understanding how, for instance, the pace of our life is moving, I can get those signals in a different way. And so most recently, I would say maybe in the last five years, I am seeing, for instance, more of the regional boundaries. They are falling down and the colors are moving much faster from one region to another. Interesting. And that also has a huge influence on color forecasting because people right now, no matter where they live in the world, they are more open to explore colors, uh, but mostly they are open to explore colors that are imported from another country or from another time, like from the ta- from the past. We always go to the past to get influences for what is happening now or what's going to happen in the future. But obviously this, all of this, wouldn't have happened without the speed, the exponential speed, I would say, of digitalization. But most importantly, I mean, digitalization has been very important. It has played a big role in how it's influencing color. But also the fact that color has 
become publicized and popularized if you want. So I call exactly. it like like deal regulation of color because in the past color forecast and color trends were like monopolized by a few agencies of or few people that understood what that was. But now we got the publicization of color basically with the digitalization era. It allows more information to be available to a wider audience online. And so that is really helping everybody to get those cues and those signs to understand what's happening somewhere else. And why not adopt it? I love the decentralization of indeed color. You know, it's it's almost like a political term behind our world. And our world is all about emotions. It's about feelings. There's a lot of subjectivity when, when you do color and when you talk about color. But you're right. A couple of years ago, and still I meet people today that when I say that I work in color, they're surprised. They're intrigued immediately. But they're still surprised. But yes, the color field and working in color, there is more knowledge. There's more sharing of information. But I do feel that we still have some way to go because I don't think color is accepted in every field or within every company or maybe not given the importance that it truly needs in the world of design. What do you think? I totally agree with you. For instance, uh, last year I have signed up uh, a client here in uh, Canada that was inspired by seeing me speaking at Neocon. Uh, They watch me presenting about color and they basically, even though they work in color, obviously their business has to do a lot with color, but they were not paying attention to color. Mm -hmm. So they immediately got in touch with me and said, let's talk color. And now it's like an explosion of understanding color and they want to really put more emphasis on color in their business. So it is true. I feel that many businesses, although they are immersed in the business of color, because there is no product without color, even the products that are based on organic material or recycled material, they have a color to them. But I feel that more companies are really paying more attention Mostly, like I said earlier, because of the decentralization or deregulation of color and talking about color is becoming per se like a trend. And like, if you don't talk about color, oh, you're not really in tune with what's happening nowadays. And that's why, you know, you and I, we're a member of Color Marketing Group. We tap into the resources that we have and that our network has so also you do color trends with color marketing group we do color trends but how for example does color trend forecasting relate to color psychology are they compatible to you or are they two completely different things that's a very interesting question judith and i do believe that the term color psychology nowadays has become almost synonym of saying color forecasting or color trends. It's like everybody who is talking about color is talking about color psychology. But if we pause for a second and look at the definition of color psychology, like what is color psychology? Why is everybody talking about it? And so color psychology is basically is the study of color in relation to our behavior. And so it can determine how color may affect us on our day-to-day decisions, But this is, it happens on the unconscious level because of how we may react to certain colors, right? And so when it comes to forecasting at that stage, when we are in the process of forecasting, it is very important to consider where the colors that we are forecasting are going to be applied. And obviously for that uh, purpose, you need to have some idea of how each color might influence the consumer of that color, right? Whether the color is going to be applicable on a wall or on a product or even the food that we eat. Sometimes the color of the food can be devastating for us and have nasty effects on us. You talked about color and well-being, which is an important part of color psychology as well. Can you highlight the importance of color in our daily lives? Talking indeed about psychology of color, but also the well-being and how can they impact our daily emotions and feelings? If you think a little bit about our psyche, 
we are all sensitized to color meanings and, and the experience of color. And we don't even know it because that is happening at the unconscious level in our mind. And so just let's take simple examples. For instance, would you cook or eat a steak that is blue? Or for instance, <laughs> would you drink milk if the color was green? Well, oh. with, well, that's an Italian tradition, right? They drink milk with a little bit of uh, mint, so menta. But no, mm-hmm. I would not easily eat a blue steak. No, not easily. I have to be honest. Exactly. And so let's uh, be a little bit more general. Like, would you drive through a red light? Obviously not, unless you are breaking the, the rules of the road. So if we look around us, we live in societies nowadays that use so much color coding, Judith. But we are not even aware of it. I'm going to give you a very little example that we see pretty much everywhere. So let's take the school buses. Why are they painted in yellow in most countries of the world? I mean, we see yellow school buses pretty much everywhere we go. And so if you understand the psychology or the symbolism that our eyes are most sensitive to the color yellow and less sensitive to violet and red colors. So yellow is considered the color of mobility. So the school buses are painted yellow. So as other drivers, when we are on the road, we can easily spot the school buses, even when they are moving, because, you know, yellow is such a strong color that you can see it from a distance and you can see it even if you are in a car that is moving and even if the bus itself is moving. And so all of this done to make sure that we take care of the safety of the kids, obviously. And we see examples like this everywhere around us, but we take it for granted because we don't question it. We don't pay attention to it. Yeah. There's so many people that maybe you meet in your daily life or that say, I don't see color, not meaning that they're colorblind, but they're absolutely not aware of that. Yes. And I would add to that also, because we know that color is a vibration. And a lot of people who don't pay attention to color is because they are not attuned to that vibration. It's almost like when you get into an elevator and there is a background music in the elevator, just ambience music, and you don't pay attention to it. It's in there, but you don't even hear it. And it's the same thing with color. It's out there. It's talking to you, but you are not attuned to it. So you don't hear it and you don't see Because we're not listening, right? We're not listening. We're busy. We're just going... A to B, and then that's what we're doing. We're so focused that we're missing out on all the beauty that's out there. Mm -hmm. So you studied the past. You just talked a little bit about how since 2009, you've been tracking the lilacs and the yellows. That is part of indeed forecasting, because if you understand the past, you you have a better idea of what the future may bring. And that's also in color. Can you explain the audience a little bit about how you exactly do that? Like, what is your methodology? Well, before explaining a methodology, I think it's important to know that we all know that history repeats itself. And so when it comes to color forecasting and color trends, We also know that history repeats itself. So how do we know it? Because many people before us have done investigations and there are many studies out there that monitor the cyclic nature of color. So with having this in mind, obviously it's not that simple, like I'm I'm laying it down right now, but having this in mind, and because we know that, for instance, the future colors will be influenced by what's happening now on many levels, whether it's on society, economy, politics, technology, and actually even natural disasters that's going to influence colors of the future. But again, since I started doing this, and I already said that time is a continuum. That time continuum basically applies also to not only everything in life, but that includes color as well. And so when it comes to color understanding what happened in the past and going back and digging in time and understanding how certain events affected color trends or color forecast, then we would be better equipped to understand what's going to happen tomorrow with the color trends. Because the color trends happen, I would say, in a step-by-step direction. So it doesn't really fall from the sky and everything. Oops, now today (laughs) is red and tomorrow is blue. No, Although some people think that, yes. (laughs) Exactly. It doesn't 
it doesn't happen that way. So I do continuous research. I always need to understand, for instance, when it comes to color, pigments and dyes have a lot to do with how we perceive colors. So I always like to go back in time and see when pigments appeared, for instance, who discovered them and how they allowed certain people of the time to use certain colors in certain ways, whether it was in art or in in the caves, you know, all this. For instance, right now, I am reading a book called True Colors, and it's written by Keith Recker. And it's all about natural dyes and pigments from around the world. Fascinating to understand that. But also on top of this, and this might not be a secret, maybe to you, or but mm-hmm. might uh, might surprise others. I keep every single piece of information and material that I have collected throughout the years that are related to color. Like you in my collection, digitally, also physically, physically mostly, and now digitally. Yes, you know, in my collection, Judith, you will find, for instance, material from trade shows that I visited in 2008. I have USB sticks with information from that era. I have, you know, I have been a member of the Color Marketing Group since 2007. And ever since I became a member, I have never discarded a report or a color card. And so I have so much information in my toolbox about color that I always go back to it. And that helps me a lot, of course, because that is part of history. Yeah. And it's so valuable. Like I do that, for example, with magazines. Like I'm like, oh, that's last year's magazine. So I'm going to kick that one out. But it's very true that especially in color, you need to go back in order to go forward. And color tells so much about society, how we've been feeling, what happened, just like you said, political systems, disasters, for example. So what are, for example, color cycles that you every now and then you see reappear and what, for example, could be a plausible reason for them reappearing? I do think that there are different type of color cycles. So there are the big cycles, the kind of, you know, 40 year cycles, and there are smaller cycles, the type of like a 10 year cycle. And I think there are even mini cycles, the ones that I call fades, because those cycles appear and disappear, blah, 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 and they're gone. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, our mutual friend, Dori, she can tell you much about this because she did a study about that and she presented that to us uh, last year. Yeah, I love that presentation. Mm -hmm. But in general, we go uh, from cycles of like bright chromatic, to darker chromatic and browns, and then we move into pastels, and then we move into neutrals, and so on. And uh, there is a philosopher and a person who was very interested in the study of color, Dr. Leonard Oberrascher from Austria, and he did extensive research and study about this. And so usually these cycles are happening because because our brains get tired from seeing the same colors over and over and over again. If Let's say if brights and chromatics are now trending, which they are partly. So a little bit later, we're going to get tired of this. So we need to move forward to the next step. We're going to want to, our brain would want to see darker colors or brownish colors. And later we're going to see, we're going to get tired of those and we're going to move to the next step. So these cycles, if we pay attention to them, they are really out there and they manifest in front of us, even if we don't pay attention to them again. And I usually, by the way, I also don't throw away my clothing from the past. So I do notice that I can recycle my wardrobe by (laughs) keeping my stuff in the wardrobe, I don't know, 10 years, and then I wear them back and people, oh my God, that color is so trendy. Yeah, I got it 10 years ago. But it's interesting. Yeah, also in fashion, we see this, we see this happening in interior design. There are different cycles. When I did some research over the past 10 years and doing trend forecasting, I noticed that for example, fuchsia comes back every other, let's say, three, four years uh, in different shades, but the color family comes back. And lime, so the green, yellowish lime colors, they have this reappearance every four or five years in consumer goods. So it's, it's interesting to see that some colors are indeed quicker 
And then others, like, for example, yeah, what you said, the, the neutrals, and a lot of the beiges and the browns, they take a little bit longer. Because it's also different per industry, right? Color cycles per industry are also different because you can't really generalize them now, can you? Correct. What you're saying is very true because some industries, they have a life cycle of the color that is slower than other industries. We all know, for instance, in fashion, that's the easiest example I can give. In fashion, the life cycle of the colors is so short because we have four fashion seasons and every season we are changing the colors. So that goes fast. But if we take, for instance, a much, much longer life cycle of the color, let's give the example of uh, buildings, for instance, the facades of buildings, they don't change every four months or every year. The facade is out there to stay at least 30 years. So the life cycle is much longer. Or automotive, for instance, the life cycle is more in between, like four to five years. I know that automotive industries, they change, they come up with new colors every four years, every time they change the models. But even in the automotive industry, now we are seeing that the trend is moving faster and adopting the colors that we are adopting for consumer goods are also applicable in that industry. And the reason for that is because a lot of what we consume on a daily basis, whether it has a long life or a short lived life, it is going to be affected by our daily life and so and, and its influence. So if I have a red cell phone, I would love to have a red car. And why not a red pair of shoes and so on? So some industries are more in tune to do that, but some others are going to stay in the traditional area until one day they're going to, you know, change the rhythm. Yeah, color coordination, obviously, it's what a lot of people do. And it's no longer just for fashion. It's interesting how a lot of people are indeed tapping into this color immersion, let's call it. Yeah, if it's, it's like all of a sudden people living in the universe walk woke up and all of a sudden they discovered color. <laughs> yeah, it's good for us. Yes, indeed. It's very good yes. for our businesses and, and, and our lives because the more people there are that know about color and talk about color, the better. You are currently on the executive committee of Color Marketing Group as vice president of color forecasting. So that's obviously different from what you do in your current and your, your own business for a not-for-profit organization with so many different people all around the world. Can you a little bit explain what this role entails and maybe how this role also inspires you on, on possibly a daily or weekly basis? I would say that if I didn't have this role, Judith, I wouldn't have been able to navigate the pandemic during the lockdowns and the confinements in the same way that I did. Being able to be present with the Color Tribe, as we call it, a worldwide, not only in Canada, on Zoom, obviously, although it was mentally exhausting for all of us, but it really kept my sanity because I was able to connect with color on a daily basis. And, you know, color makes me happy. And I know that it makes you happy. If I go back to the role, the ultimate objective of this role basically is to deliver the annual world color forecast for the CMG members. And to achieve this goal, I overlook the outcome of all the color forecasting chromosome workshops that we conduct around the world. And so it entails reading and editing the color stories, examining the, the forecasted colors for each chromosome to make sure that we ensure the integrity of the colors. And so I also have to make sure that we generate color notations for each color in various color systems, for instance, RAL and NCS and Mansell and Pantone, et cetera, even Lab 65 and RGB. And the reason for that is to make sure that the colors that we are forecasting can be reproduced in any industry and by any color system. So it's a help and a support to the members that are using and applying the color forecast. I also make sure to provide correct data to our steering committees in, in the four regions of the world so they can distill the regional forecast properly. Yeah, because Color Marketing Group forecasts color per region and then presents them in the world color forecast in November. So this is a, a huge process that you are indeed insisting. And as you just said, the European steering, the Asia Pacific steering, North American, and then Latin American steering. Who are all these people that are actually forecasting for Color Marketing Group? Basically, these people are mostly color professionals 
And also, we are seeing more and more participation from color enthusiasts, people that are exploring color and they want to know more how to color forecast and what is color trends, etc. So it all starts at that level of participation. And these are the people that participate in the forecasting events. And so they present their research and then their research is condensed into a workshop report that include color stories and colors, obviously. Then all this data is collected from the various workshops in each of the regions. And it goes through a process that we call steering. A lot of people wonder what steering means. And so steering is basically the process of taking all this information and consolidating it, distilling it into a smaller format to create a regional forecast, which includes usually three color stories and 16 colors. And then all the four regional forecasts are consolidated into what we call the world color forecast, which includes 64 colors. But of course, I mean, none of this would happen without those color professionals and the color enthusiasts who are participating in the forecasting workshops. But most importantly, Judith, and you know that for sure, this wouldn't be possible without the members that volunteer their time in the steering committees. And they are the true architects of the forecast. And so I like to see my role as an orchestra conductor. So they play (laughs) the different instrument and I make sure that it all comes together in a way that makes sense. Does that that. make sense? Yeah, I love that. I think you should put that uh, on your LinkedIn (laughs) profile as well I love that you've always had this amazing way of indeed color naming and indeed finding certain terms and keywords that just fit a storyline a color for example it's uh, it's amazing it must be such inspiring work as well for for color marketing group but also for your daily life fills me with with amazing feelings But obviously, it takes a lot of uh, time and efforts in the background. Because of our passion for the organization, um, I think also because of our our feeling of being part of something, being a a member of this important color society, I'd call it. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And uh, needless to say that by doing that, at least for me, it's so fulfilling. It's like uh, fulfilling my dreams because I'm always immersed in color and I immersed with a huge network of color professionals from around the world, like my network band from Canada to Australia. I know people from all around the world and it gives me a lot of visibility, Judith, like the visibility that you get by being part of the executive committee in the color marketing group is just amazing. Yeah, It, it is like what you get out of it. It's worth your while. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So Montaja, what is next for you? What what is the next project for you? Or maybe do you have a color dream that you may wish to fulfill and talk about with us? You know, after I left the corporate world, I focused mainly of my on my passion, obviously, which is color. And right now I am eyeing like my legacy in this world. Like what, what is my legacy after I'm no longer here? What am I leaving behind? And so obviously, besides helping my clients with the future colors right now, I am focusing a lot on writing articles and on public speaking to spread the knowledge about colors. So hopefully, hopefully I can help someone connect and feel the vibrations of color, you know, when they hear me or when they read what I write. And so hopefully that also will blossom inside of them and they will get connected and feel the happiness that I do feel. Also, you have not heard this one before. I am currently finalizing an outline for a book that I want to write about color archaeology and its Mm -hmm. meaning to color forecasting and how this meaning, how it unfolds in the world of color forecasting. So I'm very excited to announce this. It's still in the baby steps, but hopefully I will be able to finalize this soon. Oh, that sounds super exciting. And let me know when you do. And and I make sure that maybe we can organize for another call. to do another podcast with with your findings. I'm sure that the audience is going to be super excited about that. Montaja, this has been an amazing conversation. I could go on for many more hours. I really loved her talk. And I want to thank you for participating in my podcast, The Color Authority. I think that goes two ways. I really loved this conversation. I love dialoguing with you. I 
Thank you again for having me. And I'm really looking forward to see you sometime soon and give you a big hug. So this was Judith Van Vliet from The Color Authority. Thank you for listening again to yet another episode. If you haven't done so, please go to Apple Podcasts, subscribe, review, and send us feedback on this episode. And I hope that you will be listening to the next episode coming out very, very soon. Thank you and have an amazing, colorful day.